So here it is, Holy Thursday and April Fool's Day. And also, coincidentally, this is the date of publication of the book. No one has been able to buy one before this date. And there are some that can be signed at the back before you're through if you'd like to have one to take home in exchange for a little bit of guilt. Uh, uh, which I think is normal practice. But tonight, I'm stalling for the cameraman. I'm ready. <laughs> You're on. My cameraman is, is Mark Meal, son of, son of, who's your father's name? Dr. Meal. <laughs> Who? The veterinarian, Dr. Meal. Bill Meal. William Meal. Oh, Bill Meal. I, I know this guy. No, well, I know what happens. You will all know what happens. <laughs> One day, it was one night, I remember he was here, I was introducing a speaker and talking about his, his name dropped completely, completely. And finally he realized what was going on and he shoved his book in front of me. And there was an outburst of laughter and applause. And I did explain after it died out and explained to the speaker that everybody was so damn glad that it didn't happen to them. <laughs> that was it. Now, on the other Steve, but Mark, thank you very much for coming, and uh, I look forward to your results. He's helped us out a number of other times. Now, our speaker tonight, author, and quite a good writer, a very good writer. I've read your book, no, good writer. Uh, and we went to college, same college or so, <laughs> that helps too. But on the other hand, the graph is there. But the, he has written a number of articles for magazines such as the uh, Smithsonian, etc. This is his first book, and he became fascinated with the subject, but I don't quite know why, but he obviously has done a tremendous amount of research for it. I've read half the book, I can not admit, I read the whole book. I've read about halfway through, and the research was excellent, or his imagination is excellent. But I have a feeling, knowing the background of a lot of this stuff in England, uh, that you have genuine knowledge of what actually was going on. And so, uh, tonight's book, come, come here. I was going to call you Stuart Doug. Come here, Doug. Okay. And I, I introduce you. And the floor is yours. I'm sure I should have said some other things about you. But now that we're set and I'm out of breath, he is now yours and the audience is yours. Please make a great Thank you. Well, happy April Fool's Day, everybody. And it uh, really is the publication date today, the official date of this book, which is my first book. I'm from Ipswich, and I've been writing for magazines for about 25 years. Um, and I've written a lot of stories for Smithsonian Magazine over the years, often on history and the arts. And I did a story a few years ago on um, the so-called authorship controversy, which is who really wrote Shakespeare? Shakespeare or somebody else? And uh, I got more mail for that story than anything I'd ever done. Um, which is one reason I thought of writing this book, because I think there's an unending uh, fascination. Um, and this, this is a true story. I didn't make it up, and I didn't forge it. It's really a history story. But it has a lot of the elements of a, a novel. It's a, a very um, improbable story and on a lot of levels. It's, uh, I, by the way, my wife got this um, projector to work. Um, and if it wasn't for that, we wouldn't be seeing any videos. Yeah. Um, this is William, William Henry Ireland, who's the uh, main character. This is William Henry in uh, his early 20s, 1798. Despite his name, Ireland, he was English. And um, he was. Uh, this is a couple of years after uh, these sequence of events. He began his uh, brief career in forgery when he was 19 years old and working as an unpaid apprentice to a lawyer friend of his father. And 
um, he, he tended to discover uh, papers in uh, Shakespeare's handwriting in old trunk. Um, he kept finding more and more papers, finally discovered so an entire unknown play in Shakespeare's handwriting that had never been published and never been performed. And it caused a literary uproar um, that was the sensation of the day in the 1790s in England. Um, I'm not sure if it's going to carry it. <clears throat> this is a um, The Ireland family lived uh, just off the Strand in London's West End, or what was then the West End on Norfolk Street. Um, this is Charing Cross in 1750 by Ken Little. They lived down there four or five blocks on a um, very fashionable residential street. His father, Samuel, was a uh, very prosperous collector. He was a Rather, I guess I'm going to have to use the uh, cursor. Or Koki, maybe you can see it here. And I'll just see you. Um, this is his father, Samuel, uh, at about the time William Henry was born. He was a uh, writer of travel books, which he illustrated with his own engravings. And he was also a, a collector of uh, antiquarian artifacts. He collected rare books and manuscripts and other odds and ends. And uh, this is uh, a time in England in the late 1700s when just hit the cursor that says Sorry. Uh, oh, second. <laughs> He had 
quite a number of rarities. Um, often there were things from monarchs here, a ring from uh, Louis XIV, a lock of hair from Edward III, I think, a piece of a mummy's shroud. But the heart of the collection were rare books and manuscripts. The most valuable thing he owned was the first folio. He actually owned two or three, between two. This is the first folio was the first edition of Shakespeare's collected plays. It um, appeared in 1623, which is about it's seven years after Shakespeare died. And um, at the time, these were known to be valuable, but you could buy one for five pounds in uh, 1770. By the 1790s, when this story takes place, um, you could buy one for 35 pounds which was considered a stiff price. Today, there's one in England that's in shoot, it was stolen recently and recovered. The insurance was going to pay 15 million for it. So Samuel's very proud of this, but not, it's still frustrating him because this is a mass-produced object. This is a, a book made by a printer, and there are hundreds made. In fact, at Folger Shakespeare Library today in Washington has more than 100 in its basement. Um, what he really wanted was, um, something unique, and specifically something in Shakespeare's handwriting. And this would have been especially exciting because nobody had ever found any of Shakespeare's papers in 1795. Um, this is the third page of Shakespeare's last will. He signed a few months before he died. This is a signature. It just says, by me, William, you can't read it. So maybe Shakespeare. And throughout this period, people all called him Shakespeare. Um, very wildly. Uh, but that's all we have. There were four known signatures in the, 17, in the beginning of the story. There's now six. Um, but that said, we're all in legal documents. Nobody's ever seen any first draft of any of the plays. Nobody's ever seen a poem or even a sentence in Shakespeare's handwriting, which is why some people doubt that William Shakespeare is the author of all the plays and poems. So, at this time, in the late 1700s, it's worth understanding that um, Shakespeare had just been deified. He had become a god by the late 1700s. This is typical, the way he would be portrayed. This was a sculpture that was, um, or it's a drawing of a sculpture that used to be over the entrance to the Shakespeare Gallery, which was the first art museum in England. Uh, opened, I think, in 1786. And inside, all it was, was paintings commissioned of scenes from Shakespeare's plays. And that was the first art museum, uh, which in itself is a sign of how people worship Shakespeare. But this artist gave him a muscular body, a Greek god, this sort of language pose. And this was typical. People wanted Shakespeare to be the deity they wanted him to be, regardless of the fact that nobody knew anything about him. We don't know what Shakespeare looked like. We don't know whether he was tall or short, fat or skinny. Nobody ever wrote down that. The first folio portrait was a pretty crummy piece of art by somebody who never met him. Um, and uh, the man who really began the cult of Shakespeare, the sort of deification, was David Garrick. He was an actor in the mid-1700s, who was not a method actor exactly, but before Garrett, actors would sort of step up to the front of the stage and just, you know, orate. They would shout their lines and not really act. Maybe the way some people think opera singers perform. He would uh, cry on cue. You know, he was very, uh, he was electrifying among the audiences. And he really revived Shakespeare by as the manager of the Drury Lane Theatre Royal, um, mounting 10 Shakespeare plays a year, season, 10 different plays. Before that, Shakespeare had been out of fashion. In fact, even before Shakespeare died in 1616, he was no longer in fashion. And through the 1600s, he was mostly in eclipse. So this was a, a shift. 